Hey guys, just letting you know that this video is a re-upload, because the previous version of this video had some, well, let's just say some naughty naughty no-no music in it. So for copyright reasons, it's had to be altered. So let's get on with the show, with this new video that doesn't have naughty naughty no-no music. In 1990, Alex Murphy, aka Robocop, exploded his way back onto the big screen in Robocop 2, the eagerly awaited sequel to the 1987 original, where this time Robocop must take on a new drug called Nuke, which has a terrifying grip on Detroit City, along with evil drug dealer Kane and his trusty sidekick, a juvenile criminal called Hob. And if poor old Robo didn't have a hard enough time dealing with this new dangerous drug running havoc in the city, those pesky brewrocrats at OCP are at it again, this time to create a new Robocop. A Robocop 2, and what makes matters worse is that Kane's brain is then used to be the brain of the new updated Robocop. Because, you know, that makes sense. Which leads to an exciting and explosive showdown. Robocop 2 didn't fare up as well as its original, which has been hailed as a masterpiece and was honestly an impossible act to follow. But over the years, Robocop 2 has gotten more support from fans, who have said, you know what, it may not be as good as the original, but it's still a pretty good fun film regardless. So with that, today we are going to look into 10 things that you didn't know about Robocop 2. Isn't this a school day? Number 10, Frank Miller's Robocop. Robocop's creators, Edward Newmeyer and Michael Miner, had their own script for Robocop 2, but they ended up leaving the production and taking their script with them. Robocop 2's production then turned to love him or hate him comic book writer Frank Miller who wrote an original script for the Robo sequel. However, the studio deemed the script to be unfilmable, so rewrites were required, along with drastic changes being made. At the time, Miller was trying to break out into Hollywood, so Robocop was his opportunity to leap from comic page to movie screen. And I feel that having him write the script, or at least part of it, is why Robocop 2 has more of a simplistic comic book feel, as opposed to the original, which felt more like a surreal nightmare satire. Despite the fact his script was drastically changed, Miller still had a cameo in Robocop 2 as a drug manufacturer, also called Frank. Miller's original Robocop 2 script was eventually released in comic book format in a comic book series appropriately titled Frank Miller's Robocop, which sadly didn't have great reviews. Number nine, directed by the King of Sequels. Originally, TV director Tim Hunter was on board to direct Robocop 2, but during the movie's early production, he left the project. So the production then turned to the very man to redefine movie sequels and to prove that a sequel can be just as good, if not better, than its original, Irvin Kirshner. Kirshner, just 10 years earlier, had directed The Empire Strikes Back, which many argue is the greatest sequel of all time, and many have also noticed Kirshner's focus on character development in the Star Wars sequel. And given that the original Robocop was all about the growth and development of Alex Murphy finding his soul and going on a journey from corporate product to human again, Kirshner would have seemed like the perfect choice. However, it really didn't turn out that way. Although at the start of the movie, there are themes of Robocop still finding and reclaiming his humanity, those themes get lost in action sequences as the movie goes on. And thus Kirshner's talents of being a character-driven director couldn't be fully utilized for Robocop 2. But he still does a great job on the movie. You can tell that he's doing his best with the material that he has. Robocop 2 was the last movie he worked on as a director, but the last directing job he did was on an episode of Sequest DSV in 1993. And not forgetting, of course, he also directed the unofficial James Bond movie Never Say Never Again starring Sean Connery. 
So he's directed a Star Wars movie, a James Bond movie, and a Robocop movie. Man, Irvin Kirshner had a pretty impressive resume. So while all this was happening, where was the original Robocop director, Paul Verhoeven? Well, he was too busy making the truly excellent Total Recall. Number eight, Robo's new clothes. No doubt about it, Robocop's robotic armor looks frickin' badass. It's so awesomely iconic, it's instantly recognizable. However, while making the first Robocop movie, actor Pisa Weller found the suit restrictive and hard to move around in, to the point where in shots where you couldn't see the actor's legs, he was just walking around in his underwear, while still wearing the armor on the upper part of his body. So for Robocop 2, a different suit was made. This time it was made out of fiberglass, which actually made the suit look more metallic and helped Weller to be able to move around more freely. I actually prefer the armor in the sequel, to be honest. It looks more sleek and polished than it did in the original. I also felt like it had a blue tint to it, unlike the original movie in which it looked a little bit more gray. That's not just me that notices that, right? I mean, in Robocop 2, his armor was pretty blue, yeah? Number seven, filming location. Despite being set in Detroit, Robocop 2 was filmed in Houston. A similar thing happened with the original Robocop, which was filmed in Dallas. Director Irvin Kirshner claimed that he liked Houston's calmness, which made it easier to shoot during night, but also claimed that rain and snow could often get in the way of filming. Different scenes required many interesting Houston locations. For example, Houston City Hall was used for the OCP headquarters. Robocop 2's finale was filmed at Houston Theatre District. And the warehouse where Kane and his fugs make the nuke drug was filmed at an old rundown abandoned hospital. I think Houston looks just fine in the movie, however I do also think that the changes of cities do stand out somewhat. I always felt like you could tell that the location was now different and didn't quite look like the terrifying world of the original. It looked cleaner and more well presented, unlike the original which had a dirty grit about it. Number 6, Video Game as with the original Robocop, Robocop 2 got its own video game, which was released on several systems. But like most kids of the early 90s, the version of the game I got was the Nintendo one. I can remember hiring it from the video store and getting excited for the title screen, with Robocop looking badass like he's ready to blast some wrongdoers. But I remember once I started playing, I just didn't like the gameplay. I found it confusing and hard to follow. Like, what's with this level where it looks like you're in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory? I love this melodramatic screaming person here, who Robo must save by stomping on their head. Um, okay, makes sense. A lot of the game looks weird with bizarre color choices, so it's not a visually pleasing game. It just feels weird and sporadic. However, one thing I will give the game credit for is the end fight with Robo Kane. I always felt that it did feel pretty epic and badass. Number 5, Smoking PSA. So in Robocop 2, there was a humorous subplot where Robocop's wiring gets scrambled in an attempt to make him more child friendly while being a positive role model and even delivering environmental messages. During his personality crisis, there is a memorable scene where Robocop shoots at a bystander with a cigarette in his mouth and thanks him for not smoking. Thank you for not smoking. This clip was actually licensed and used in many theaters in the early 90s and would be played before the start of a movie as a reminder that smoking is not prohibited in said movie theater. The message was a simple one. Don't smoke or Robocop will shoot you. That seems like a sound enough reason not to light up if you ask me. Smoking in movie theaters had died down in the 70s, but there were still some selected theaters throughout the 80s and early 90s which still allowed smoking. But by the time Robocop 2 came out, it was time for movie audiences to butt out. <laughs> yeah, you see the pun I did there? <laughs> Number four, think of the children. Robocop 2 was made on a budget of $35 million and only made $45 million in the box office, so it wasn't exactly a knockout success. 
A common complaint with the movie is that it just didn't have the heart and soul of the original Robocop. The heart and soul that Alex Murphy worked hard to reclaim by the end of the first movie. But instead, it just felt like a violent action movie without any of the intellectual themes of the original. Supposedly, even Peter Weller approached the movie's production and claimed that there should be some kind of emotional goal and payoff at the end of the movie, rather than just robots hitting each other, in order to give the movie more emotional weight but his pleas were overlooked. I think with Robocop 2, they were going for a more carefree popcorn action movie approach. However, one thing that the critics seem to hate is the fact that one of the villains, Hob, was a young boy. The very fact that this kid was shown to be an evil delinquent seemed to drive critics bonkers and not allow Robocop 2 a pass. Here's what I find confusing. Yes, Hob is a horrible character who also is a child, but it's because the character has been misguided by Kane and not just evil because reasons. And in addition to that, Robocop 2 came out the same year as Home Alone and everyone was a-okay with Kevin McAllister violently maiming people with the character even creating sadistic death traps of torture. So isn't it weird that if it's a comedy, it's okay, but a more serious science fiction movie, then well, that's just tasteless. Behave yourself! Yeah, it's weird how two movies came out the same year, both featuring violent kids. Only with this one we can say, no, oh, isn't he adorable? Let's make his movie the biggest movie of the year. But with this one, it's like, nope, we cannot allow this. Get out. Number three, deleted scenes. So as with all movies, Robocop 2 has its fair share of deleted scenes. Some of these include an extended scene where the baseball team of kids rob the electrical goods store, where Robocop lets them go, where the store owner then goes berserk at Robocop, which then leads to Robocop strangling the store owner. I'm guessing it was felt that that scene would have made Robocop look even more like an idiot. Speaking of that scene with the baseball kids, that one little boy who says, Shit is played by Adam Ferezel, who that very same year also played Little Eddie in the IT miniseries. Another scene sees Robocop observing a woman in a shower at the police headquarters. I guess it's to demonstrate the reality that Alex Murphy is no longer an organic man, along with having his natural instincts and desires. There is also another scene where we see a news report which further explains OCP's desire to take control of the entire city. Look, I don't think any of these scenes are particularly needed or complete the movie if they were added, but it's still interesting to see moments of Robocop 2 that never made it into the final film. Number two, Robocop 3 went into production straight after part two. The original plan was for Robocop 3 to go straight into production once the production on Robocop 2 wrapped up. Some of Frank Miller's rejected ideas for Robocop 2 made it into the script of Robocop 3. The Robo suit that was used for Robocop 3 was actually a suit built for part 2 but never used. However, Robocop 3's production got postponed due to Orion Pictures bankruptcy issues. By the time Robocop 3 went back into production, Peter Weller bailed on the project to star in Naked Lunch instead. You can't blame Weller for not wanting to return to the role as he was disappointed that the series was going into more action movie territories as mentioned. And his character didn't really get to progress in Robocop 2. He was more of a MacGuffin used to defeat the villains, rather than a character going on an existential journey as seen in the first movie. That, and he's hardly seen without his Robocop armor in part two, which I'm guessing may have made him feel less like an actor and more like a stuntman. So thinner actor, Robert John Burke suited up for Robocop in the third installment, wearing the suit intended for the second movie, to which he struggled with the fact that the suit was a bit too small for him as it was originally constructed for Peter Weller. But the biggest blow to Robocop 3 was making it more kid-friendly and giving it a PG-13 rating, completely taking away from the violent and dangerous world the first two movies had been building. And in addition to that, one of the subplots of Robocop 2 was about the corporate officials trying to make Robocop more kid-friendly, which doesn't work. With the message being that Robocop isn't for kids. So it's like Robocop 3 went back on that message. Number one, original sequel idea. 
What with Robocop 2's flaws, it's still a perfectly enjoyable movie. You have to give credit for it trying something new. I actually like the idea of the city being terrorised by a futuristic drug. However, Robocop 2 was originally going to be a lot different. As the first movie's writers, Edward Newmeyer and Michael Miner, had originally written up a draft for Robocop 2 called Robocop Corporate Wars, in which Robocop gets shot by a cannon and literally turns into dust, only to be resurrected 25 years later. I guess going with the resurrection themes the first movie had previously explored, where this time the city is even more run down than seen in the first movie, to which the world of Robocop is a sheer nightmare of dystopia. Robocop even has a relationship with an artificial intelligence neurobrain in a subplot that continues the reclaiming of humanity seen in the first movie. The two writers, though, eventually left the project, and it's kind of a shame that nothing happened with the Robocop Corporate Roars outline, as it would have made one crazy, insane Robocop movie. Robocop 2 doesn't live up to the perfection of the first movie, but it's still a film that I have a lot of fun when I watch. It's best to not expect a deep movie like the original and to just simply observe Robocop 2 as a comic book movie. It has the edge of the first film, but not the fort. But that's okay, as sometimes I don't want to think while watching movies and I just want to have a fun explosive adventure. So I understand the movie's criticisms, but I also think it deserves another viewing from skeptical fans. Anyway, I'm Minty, and my Prime Directives are informing me to say see ya! See ya!